our first episode. If you like all things spooky and macabre, and you're into the supernatural, if murder is your thing, okay, that sounded bad. So hopefully murder is not your thing, but maybe if you like true crime, then Phantom Crime Podcast might just be the place for you. Here, we're going to cover a variety of those topics, from hauntings and possessions to murder and mayhem. And before we get started, please just let me apologize for the delay in the release of our first episode. You know how life is. Our daily and mundane tasks get in the way, and before you know it, a month has gone by. Not to mention, I let somebody borrow my laptop just to look at it for a minute, and all my work got deleted. Let's not get into that. But not to worry, friends, because we are finally here at last. So now, take a seat and stay for a while. My fellow armchair detectives, make yourself comfortable, because we're going to take a dive into our very first case. Episode 1, A Tale of Two Victims. On December 20th, 1786, in New London, Connecticut, 12-year-old Hannah Ocuish was hung. To understand how Hannah ended up at the end of the hangman's noose, we have to understand a little bit more in relation to what we know regarding her sad and short life. Hannah was a member of the Pyquote Nation, at least on her mother's side. In a sermon printed in the paper by the Reverend Henry Channing, she is called a mulatto girl, which probably is a reference to her being a child of mixed race, most likely having a white father. But we don't really know for sure because her father is never mentioned in any of the court records or newspaper articles of the times. Hannah was often referred to as having a mental disability or a hardship of some sort. Of course, nothing goes into much detail on what exactly this may have been by how she acted. But in the late 1700s, they probably wouldn't have known much about it themselves either. She was probably lucky that she never ended up locked away in one of those horrible madhouses. But since she ended up being executed, she didn't fare much better there either. Now, I looked up how to say Paiko, and if I mispronounced it, I'm sorry. Please don't come for me here. And once again, according to the good Reverend Channing, who seems to be involved in this case quite a lot, but it's only because he wrote the sermon that was delivered to the papers for her execution, Hannah's mother was, and I quote, an abandoned creature, much addicted to the vice of drunkenness. And it may be due to that very reason that at six years old, Hannah was sent away by her mother to go live with a white family and work as their servant. The records don't state whether this was because she wanted money for her daughter or if she was ill and could just no longer care for her or exactly why she did this. But could we just stop and talk about this for a minute? Could you even imagine this from either side? Because as a parent, there's no way I could just send my kid off to a life of servitude. You'd have to rip her from my cold, dead fingers. I I just, I couldn't do it. I want my baby with me. I want to see them grow and... I want to take care of them. I don't trust other people to do it. And from Hannah's point of view, that must have been absolutely terrifying. How much work can a six-year-old even do, though? I can barely get my nine-year-old to clean her room or wash the dishes. I can't imagine she'd be much help, especially having a disability of some sort. But at this point, it's a little unclear as to what happened to Hannah's mother. From this point on, she's always referred to as being an orphan, and the only time that her mother's ever mentioned again is in the sermon at Hannah's execution to chastise her for spoiling Hannah, saying that if she hadn't, then Hannah would have never been to the point where the crime was ever committed and she wouldn't have had to be executed. Now, I don't know about you, but I wouldn't consider sending a six-year-old away from everything that they've ever known to go work as a servant being spoiled. I don't know. I could be wrong. Call me crazy. But now, at six years old, this mentally disabled child is totally alone in the world. She's having to work as a servant to others, probably total strangers that look down upon her, that are unkind. She's living what one can only imagine would be an incredibly lonely and difficult life. And not long after becoming a servant, Hannah is now accused of beating another child and trying to steal a necklace from them. She's brought before the court, where an anonymous author describes her as follows. Quote, 
Her conduct, as appeared in evidence before the Honorable Superior Court, was marked with almost every bad thing. Theft and lying were her common vices. To these were added a maliciousness of disposition which made children in the neighborhood much afraid of her. She had a degree of artful cunning and sagacity beyond many of her years. End quote. Okay, stop right there. Whoever this author was, was on some serious bullshit and spewing some nonsense. Could Hannah have been a thief and a liar? Absolutely. Could she have done malicious enough things to be scaring the other kids in the neighborhood? I guess it's possible. I, I mean, she's somewhere between 6 and 12. I, Yeah, kids can be bullies. Sure, we'll go with that. Was she artfully cunning? No, I'm not going to buy that. This is a kid, and again, somewhere between 6 and 12 years old at this point. She's mentally disabled to some degree. I don't think she has the ability to be artfully cunning. I think it's more likely that we're dealing with a child whose behavior is not understood by the townspeople, whose skin color is brown, and between the two of those things, because remember, we're in the late 1700s here. People are just naturally frightened of her because they just don't understand what's going on with her because she's dark skinned. Maybe some of the people are even harboring hate towards her. Perhaps she saw a shiny necklace and she wanted to touch it and the other child was scared or disgusted because Hannah was dirty or for whatever reason they tried to get away, but maybe Hannah didn't understand boundaries. Our mental and health systems today, even our justice systems might understand but there were no exceptions to be made for a half-native servant child in those days. There isn't much more information to be found on Hannah or her life until June of 1786 at the New London Strawberry Harvest. Sometime on that day, another child, six-year-old Eunice Bowles, accuses Hannah in front of the town of stealing some strawberries. Nothing's on record about what became of the accusation, whether it was true, whether it wasn't, whether Hannah ever got in trouble. But what child can't resist a big, ripe, juicy strawberry shining in the sun in front of them? I can picture the sweet smell in the air as the berries are sitting out, warming up. The townspeople are out selling their jams, their pies maybe. It's not hard to imagine many wide-eyed kids out running about and maybe a few of them snuck a berry or two that day least of all one who's a servant the lowest class of people in the town maybe a little malnourished underfed maybe trying to fill their pockets with something to have later because they know they're not going to get dinner in any event the accusation was made and that's all we know about it we don't know how far it went but five weeks later on the morning of July 21st, 1786, Eunice Bowles said goodbye to her family as she left to walk to school. That would be the last time that her family saw her alive, because by 10 o'clock a.m., her body was discovered. Eunice's body was found off the side of the main road leading from New London to Norwich, lying face down next to a rock wall. Some of the stones had been pulled down from the wall and put on top of her body in an attempt to make her death appear like an accident, suggesting that the wall had fallen on top of her and killing her suddenly. However, this didn't seem to fool authorities and investigators at the time. It appeared that Eunice had not only been badly beaten, but she had also been strangled and even stoned. I can't even imagine. We're, we're talking about a little child and these are always hard to talk about and think about. And so here we are with poor little six-year-old Eunice and her body was just covered in bruises and lacerations. On top of that, she'd also suffered from a broken arm, a skull fracture, and a broken back. The attack that she experienced was beyond brutal and the town wanted justice, rightfully so. Investigators began questioning the townspeople, and everyone began pointing fingers towards the direction of 12-year-old Hannah Okuish. She must have still been holding a grudge about Eunice tattling on her for stealing the strawberries, they said. That was motive. 
When investigators questioned Hannah, she told them that she hadn't seen Eunice that day, but that she had, in fact, seen four boys walking up the road in the same direction earlier that morning. Investigators questioned her again and again. She gave the same story. So they went out looking for the boys, asking the townspeople about them, but the boys were unable to be located. Upon re-questioning Hannah and getting the same story repeated to them once again, investigators asked her who the boys were, and when she was unable to identify them, authorities became suspicious that she had made up the boys entirely and that she herself was the murderer. So let's pause here again for a minute. I mean, you want me to believe that a 12-year-old girl who was probably small and malnourished from being a servant had the strength to beat another child to death so severely that she snapped her back in half. I mean, this is a serious beating we're talking about from the way it sounded. That's brutal. I can't imagine one kid inflicting that upon another kid and to the the amount of strength that it would have taken to do such a crime. On top of that, she's mentally disabled. But she had enough wherewithal to stage it to look like an accident and then not even act the least bit nervous afterwards throughout going her day throughout town and then being questioned by the authorities. I, I don't think that's possible. I sure maybe if she's an adult, maybe if she doesn't have any kind of mental incapacities, but a 12 year old mentally handicapped kid. No. I, 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 I don't believe it. I believe that she's the easy suspect. She's the one that they can all pat each other on the back for a good day's work and feel good about it at the end of the day. They can sleep peacefully knowing that they caught the bad guy. And, you know, she's, she's a servant after all. She's not really part of their society. She's just some pie quote mulatto girl. Now, remember, those are their words printed in the paper. Those aren't mine. Don't come for me for it. That's what they said. She's the one that they can arrest and they can say, of course it was her. Just look at her. They can send her to the executioner without feeling guilty about it. She's not really one of them after all. Because as much as times have changed, they really haven't. But if we get back in track here for a minute. Now, after investigators have questioned Hannah again, her story still hasn't changed. But she hasn't been able to name or identify the boys. So they just know she's guilty. And there was just one thing left for them to do. What's that, you may ask? Well, they picked her up and carried her off, of course. The investigators tossed Hannah over their shoulders like a sack of potatoes. And they marched right through town, straight to the Bulls' home, where the little battered and broken body of Eustace lay out for the mourning family to grieve over. Investigators set Hannah down in front of the Bulls family. They made her look at Eunice's body. Then they charged Hannah with Eunice's murder and began questioning her over and over again until she allegedly burst into tears and confessed to them by saying, if she could be forgiven, she'd never do so again. Hannah sat in jail until her trial began in October of 1786. Despite her age and mental incapabilities, she was convicted and sentenced to death. The judge concluded her trial by saying, quote, The sparing of you on account of your age would, as the law says, be of dangerous consequence to the public by holding up an idea that children might commit such atrocious crimes with impunity, end quote. It seemed that Hannah was totally unaware as to what her sentence meant, and it had to be explained to her. Afterwards, she cried uncontrollably for half the day. On December 20th, 1786, Hannah Akiosh was brought to the gallows. A quote from the executioner on the day of her death is as follows. She said very little, appeared greatly afraid, and seemed to want someone to help her. She thanked the warden for his kindness and launched into the eternal world. End quote. Hannah Akush was the last documented female to be executed in the state of Connecticut and the youngest documented legally executed criminal in America. 
Her guilt, however, has never been comprehensively proven or disproven. So now, I leave it up to you listeners. What do you believe? Was Hannah Akiosh angry at Eunice Bowles for telling on her for stealing the strawberries? Was she waiting and plotting her revenge, just waiting for the right time to strike back? Or is the murder of Eunice Bowles and the execution of Hannah Akiosh really just the tale of two victims?